when I went home, I like was counting all my money, like under my bed sheet with a flashlight. I was like, wow, oh my God, I'm rich. And I called my little sister into my room. I was like, come see. She was like, you're crazy. I was like, look at all this money. It was like $140, but at the time it felt like a million dollars. Yeah. I was like, Think wow. All the candy bars I could buy. I you. know, I was like, we're gonna be rich. We need so much candy. <laughs> And she was my little partner in crime. So like when I would sneak out, she would like keep the window open, like make sure I get down safely. And then she would shut it and she'd be like, be careful. And I was like, oh, I gotta get back for my little sister. <laughs> she loves me so much. <laughs> but she was always like looking out for me. Like one time I asked her to go downstairs and like break a plate and like cause a distraction in the kitchen so I can go through the front door. And she did. And I could hear my dad back there like, what's going on in here? <laughs> Oh my god. And I was like, bless her heart. Oh, she's so sweet. So then I like ran out the front door and I just, I always bought her whatever she wanted with all my money and be like, I got you that Victoria's Secret bag. I got you. <laughs>
but it, it was between the Hutus and the Tutsis. So the Tutsi, when Rwanda was founded, were the monarch, like the royalty people. Right. And the Hutus were like farmers and agriculture and stuff. Mm-hmm. And until the Belgians came, there was no identification for that. You know, it wasn't like you're a Hutu because your ID card says that. Mm-hmm. So when the Belgians came, they um, enforced this ID thing and it really caused a lot of turmoil and led to civil wars and and the genocide eventually so they kind of wanted to categorize everybody i would imagine in a way to be able to conquer and Mm -hmm. rule them so like the tutsis were described as tall with long thin noses and uh, the tutsis were described as shorter with like flatter nose and um, Wait, the Hutu, which one? The Hutus? The Hutus, yeah. Were the, the farmers and stuff. So the Tutsis were the royalty and stuff. Right, and they had the long, thin noses. Mm-hmm. And the tallness. Like, and the tallness. They can be up to seven feet tall. Wow. <laughs> as a Tutsi. And there's a picture from, like, 1961 of, like, the Belgians coming. Mm-hmm. And there's the Tutsi men, the kings and queens, and they're just, like, this tall. And the Belgians are, like, right next to them, wow. but they're so tiny. And they kind of favored the Tutsis when they came to Rwanda. And was it because they were because they were the ruling class at the time, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that caused a lot of like hatred and racism within its our own country, right? And that led to the Hutus like exiling a bunch of Tutsis. About three hundred thousand people were kicked okay. out in the sixties. Wow! And my parents grew up in that time. So it was kind of like the the underclass, which is what mm-hmm. the Hutus had been made, yep. like overthrowing the yes. Bwaji. Like, right, and know. they kicked them out. Now they're, then they were in power for about 10 years or something. Mm-hmm. And the genocide started when the Hutu president, um, I think he was trying to do a deal. I Don't quote me on this, but they were trying to have a balance within the government with Tutsis and Hutus. Mm-hmm. You know? So he signed an agreement, I believe, or something to joined these two people and then his sh- his plane got shot down and he was with the the Burundi president as well and that's what kicked off the genocide of 94 is the plane crash and they blame it on Tutsis or Hutu extremists like it's unclear who shot the plane down but right. it definitely kick-started the war and Hutus because there was like a power vacuum mm-hmm. right and so they were on the radio and stuff doing all kind of propaganda and tv and stuff like you should go kill all the Tutsis they're the reason for your problems Mm -hmm. they just shot down the president like go murder them now and about 800,000 people were killed in like six weeks neighbors just started murdering people like if your neighbor's a Hutu and they know you're a Tutsi they would just come in with machetes and just murder your whole family so it wasn't just like the government coming after people it was like everyone you know would just murder you so there's a lot of horrible horrible stories and the church sometimes would lie to people like uh the priest would be like a hutu right Mm -hmm. and he would get a bribe from the extremists like you get as many tutsis in this church as you can and they would put grenades in there and just blow them all up as under false pretenses like we're gonna save you come to the church we'll rescue all the tutsis and then you get murdered yeah it's pretty awful stuff yeah and so I, so your father was able to escape. Sounds like your great grandmother did not. No, she did not. Um, but your grandmother and your grandfather mm-hmm. did with your yep. with your father and then your mother went through the same She went through the exact same thing. They were actually like family friends at the time. Okay. So they kinda grew up knowing each other. Okay. And my dad was a little bit older than my mom and they were, fell madly in love. And um during the war my dad was actually in the army to try to get Rwanda back. Because there was a, a a political party called the RPF, mm-hmm. and they were founded by the Tutsis that were er- exiled in the 60s mm-hmm. um, to come back and take Rwanda back, you know? Mm-hmm. And my dad was part of that. Um, so he saw a lot of awful things. <laughs> yeah, I but, can imagine. Um, uh, the RPF eventually won the war, and so the leader of the rpf kagame he's Mm -hmm. the president to this day okay so they they kind of won and rescued rwanda (laughs) yeah yeah so what is what is the political climate like now there it is good um because your country has bounced right yes he's back there he retired from his job in the government and um the country as a whole is about forgiveness you know i've never seen 
a group of people go through so much hatred and turmoil and then turn around and hold hands with everyone and just be like, let's never let this happen again. Mm -hmm. And let's move on as a country and try to be better. And economically, they're just developing like crazy. Like it's a really lo lovely country. It's one of the cleanest countries in Africa. There's gorgeous hotels and resorts and mountain gorillas. If you like those, you can go to a resort and spend time with them alongside them. And that's something I've always wanted to do. So wow. maybe I'll maybe I'll go back for that. Wow. <laughs> so you would recommend that like people oh, yeah. visit Rwanda? Big time. It's gorgeous. The hotels are pristine. They've just made like a whole um, like movement to for, for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And these people that did the genocide and stuff, like they're they will have meetings between the families that they murdered and the murderers and they will come and apologize and have like public apologies and it's so emotional wow. <laughs> like it's really incredible and they really come and some people forgive them some mm -hmm. people don't forgive them but yeah. it's about the effort right as a nation yeah i mean we we definitely shy away from like political conversations on this show just because yeah. that's generally not what people are here for but I mean, you know, we can't ignore what's going on in Israel and exactly. in Gaza right now. Yep. So when you see that and people are like calling it a genocide, yep. um, how does that make you feel knowing what your family went through? It, it's devastating because I know it's been like a long war between Israel and uh, Palestine mm -hmm. for like a long, long, long time. Yeah. And it just breaks my heart because there is so much love to be had in the world but a lot of times people choose to hate and it i think it roots from ignorance you know mm -hmm. if we could just all be a little bit more kinder to each other and consider it that we're just human beings then you won't have such awful things but that's you know like cartoon world <laughs> yeah <laughs> nothing really happens that way and people do have conflict and it's yeah. just heartbreaking yeah i don't like it no i'm not a fan <laughs> So let's talk about your your actual upbringing. So what was South Africa like for you? Oh my God, it was so cool. I went to the best schools. Um, I was I grew up with like all the uh, mostly white children. Mm -hmm. Like that's who was at my school all the time. My dad was able to pay for a private school, and um, I had nannies and gatekeepers and a driver. So I would go to school and come straight home. I was mm -hmm. very sheltered in South Africa. I didn't understand why at the time, but I do know like no more now. There was a little bit of racial stuff, like a lot. Yeah. I mean, there was a whole apartheid in South Africa. So racial tensions were honestly more stressful there than in Rwanda. Yeah. So my parents tried to keep us sheltered. Um, I had a rooster. <laughs> when I was four years old, I fell in love with this rooster. We went to a farm and I was like, dude, I need this in my life. And I took it home to our gated community with like other people. And it would be loud every morning at like five in the morning. They just do rooster stuff. And my neighbor, he shot my chicken like straight up with a handgun. <laughs> and oh my I, my dad would tell me like, hey, the neighbors really don't like this bird. Like it's gonna escalate to something mm -hmm. worse. And I just was four. So I was like, this is my bird. Mm -hmm. He stays, but our neighbor, he was white. And I don't know if it was racial or not, but he definitely did shoot it with a gun, which is cool. <laughs> In hindsight, oh <laughs> I don't have the balls to do that now. But as a grown up, I'm like, wow, way to take over your life like that. I mean, yeah, he's it's like, definitely. that's making noise. I'm just going to shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. But that was the most tension I ever felt there. So your parents probably sheltered you from it. Big time. I had no idea what was happening ever. Yeah. I just was like, I go to school. And so you didn't good. feel that from like the other kids in school or anything no. like that? That's My really best nice. friend was white and she... She cut her bangs one time and the teacher put the excess hair in like a Ziploc bag and put it on the bulletin board. And she was like, Elizabeth, cut her hair. And then I was like, I want to be like Elizabeth. So I went home and I took scissors to my hair. <laughs> my mom was like, what is happening? <laughs> I was like, my best friend, she has bangs, so I have bangs. So well, the I bangs suit you. They you do. Bangs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I never saw the racial stuff. I was, I was friends with everyone. That's good. Yeah. So then you moved to... Texas, right? Uh, we went to back to Rwanda. Back to Rwanda. Uh, so everything had settled down, and my dad got us a house, and um, we moved back there so that I could learn the language because mm -hmm. they're very they're big about their culture. You know, they love. What is the language? 
Kenya Rwanda. Okay. So I still speak it to this day. I have an accent though when I speak it because I've been speaking English so long. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I'm speaking to other Rwandans, they're like, oh, you sound weird, but we get you. <laughs> Can you say something in, the, in your language? I have been practicing this part just for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. That means you're a beautiful woman. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thank you. Oh my gosh, speaking of, yes. before we go any further, since we turned the topic oh, yeah. to me, yes. Liz brought me a present. I did. <laughs> that I forgot to open. Hey. So I'm going to open it. I can't wait till you see it. <laughs> I'm very excited. Ooh, you can see the back, it's a painting. It's a, mm. Oh my goodness. Holly Rendell. Look, she made me a little. A I, little baby Holly <laughs> Randall unfiltered painting. That's so I cute. I did. I was like, I'm so happy you invited me. Like, oh that's great. Goodness. So I wanted to show you that I appreciate you. Oh, no, <laughs> thank you. That's so cool. Thank you. Art is like my other secret passion. I was, yeah, I was going to say, obviously, you've got some skills. I am a terrible, terrible <laughs> artist. This is really good. Yay. Thank you. Oh, look, at, look at that. Look it's that. adorable. It matches your cup. I, I, I literally copied it off. <laughs> Here we go. Adorbs. I'm gonna forget it's there, and then I'm gonna pick up my cup. And it's gonna <laughs> fall over, but we love. It. I'm gonna. I'll put. It, I'll find a place for it on my shelf. Yay! I have the same kind of shelf at home, so I love this. This yeah. is this is a good one. Yeah. No, it's that's so, so cute. cute. Thank you. You're I really welcome. appreciate that. I'm so happy too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so um, so back to you. Yes. Um, so <laughs> you were living in Rwanda, mm -hmm. and then. Your, but your family did emigrate to America eventually. Tell yes. us about why and, and how that came about. So my father is big on education. He really wants us to learn as much as possible. And ever since I was like five years old, he would like, he would let me go visit my family or like travel around on airplanes by myself. So I, in hindsight, I realized he was training me for this day. Cause when I came to America, I didn't know I was coming. I thought I was gonna go to school and uh our nanny like put us in our school uniform she had no idea um packed our lunches everything and my dad comes in he's like oh yeah i forgot we're going to the airport actually why do you think your dad didn't <laughs> prepare you for this did he was he afraid of what your reaction might be he was more afraid of other people hearing about it and like getting in the way of our visa or something because okay. he worked in the government so he had a really important job and they did not want him to leave at the time so oh, he okay. kind of secretly sent my mom over and she he told us like she's going to school, but he didn't tell us why. Mm -hmm. My mom is always in school, so it was like whatever. Mm -hmm. She's back at school, <laughs> and um, I wake up and I think I'm going to school myself, and I'm actually coming to America, which was the best day ever. And like, I really thought I was going to school, which I was dreading. I was like in fourth grade or whatever. I was like, this is lame. I don't want to go. And yeah. he's like, airport. I was like, yay! Oh my god, <laughs> we're done with school. Were you sad though? You didn't get to say goodbye to your friends. I. For some reason, I didn't care. Like, I, when I moved to Rwanda, I was still like a foreign person. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm a Rwandan, I'd been living in South Africa my whole life. Mm -hmm. So when I got there, I didn't really make that many friends. Gotcha. I was like the weird foreign girl. Right. Speaks a lot of English, not a lot of Kinyarwanda. So mm -hmm. I didn't really have a lot of friends. So I was like, okay, let's do it. Let's go. But okay. I'm also like an adventurous spirit. Like, yeah. I am down for a, a new thing. And I was really, really excited. Yeah. <laughs> So you come out to America yeah. um, and your dad didn't come until later, right? Yeah, he came like a year later. Okay. So we were at the airport and we think he's going to come with us. And he's like, actually, you guys go ahead. I'll meet you there. <laughs> and we're like, oh my God. And you're, you're the older sister, right? Mm -hmm. I, was a, I was 11 and my sister was like six. Wow. So You know, it's actually not that uncommon for younger kids to fly on planes by themselves. They actually assign you like mm -hmm. a stewardess, right? To yeah. kind of take care of and you. And she walked really fast. I remember she was like, okay, follow me. And we'd look up and she'd be like all the way down the hallway. <laughs> but we had these little badges that said unaccompanied minors yeah. <laughs> with our passport. And like my dad gave me $50, which was so much money to me as mm -hmm. a kid. I was like 50 whole dollars. And the first thing I did with my little sister is we went to a gift shop at the airport and we bought chocolate. I was just going to ask you how much candy you bought with that. We $50. bought so much candy. We're like, we're rich. Let's get all the chocolate in here and let's scram. Let's go to America. <laughs> and um, I had a little fanny pack and I, I strapped it to my seat on the plane and I forgot it, of course. So 
I left like 50 or 40 something dollars behind because right. candy's not that expensive. I was like, what is all this change? What am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> you thought like $50 would get you one candy bar. Yeah, I was like, that's like two candy bars max. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So then what was life like in the US for you? It was it was trippy. Um, I went to a school in Maine and um, all the children were adorable. They were great. Um, I remember I was at lunch one time and there was this boy and he was kind of being crazy and acting out and throwing stuff. And I told him like, hey, stop being so naughty. You know, you need to sit down and settle down. <laughs> but the word naughty in America means something else. It's kind of, it can be sexual. Yep. And so all the kids were like, ew, naughty. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, yeah, he's being really naughty. And they were like, that's so weird. Do you know what you're saying? And that's when I learned like, oh, okay, so not everything is what it seems. Yeah, it's like different. My mom's British and yeah, yeah naughty means one like thing you're to being her. A bad bitch yeah, kid. it means you're being a bad kid. <laughs> it means you're being a little fuckhead. Oh, and the worst one was when I asked for a rubber cuz like oh no. Eraser. Oh no. <laughs> eraser and rubber are the same word where I'm from, you know? So I was I wrote something wrong on my paper. And I asked my teacher in sixth grade, I was like, hey, can I get a rubber? And she was like, oh, my God, do you want to talk? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure, let's talk about it. I made a mistake. And she was like, what kind of mistake? <laughs> and I was like, I wrote something wrong. I don't know what's happening. And she was like, oh, my God, please call it an eraser. Please don't ever say rubber. <laughs> That's so funny. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. She was like, oh, my God, we got to call a counselor, get your parents in here. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's just math. Like, chill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's so crazy. funny. crazy. So there's some language barrier issues for sure. Yeah. But it, it got better. Like my accent now is like hardly even distinguishable. Yeah. People are always confused where I'm from. But I'm from everywhere. And now <laughs> I'm an American citizen. That took a while. It took like 10 years to get that. But oh, wow. it was a great day. Unfortunately, it was during COVID. Oh, so no. there, I didn't get my ceremony because usually when you yeah. become a citizen, they have like a whole thing. Yeah. But for me, they were like, all right. Do you accept America? I was like, yeah, hell yeah. And they're like, okay, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I was like, okay, thanks. But yeah. I have a question for you. So, okay. you know, we hear a lot of people complain about America and like this country so fucked up, which like, you know, is Who true. Who is it? It's true on like so many levels, yeah. you know, and, and, and I grew up here and my parents are, you know, obviously not from here. Right. Um, and there's a lot of things wrong with this country. And then you'll get like, you know, the patriots that come in and they're like, well, then move somewhere then else, go somewhere God damn else. it. Like, this is the free country, <laughs> the best country in the world. But I've talked to a lot of people who, like, um, I, I remember I had a conversation with my friend Gustavo, who's yeah. um, from Argentina, and he was like, you know, people, like, he was saying, he was talking about how he loves doing jury duty, right? Really? Which, like, we, most people <laughs> hate to do. Yeah. But for him, he's like, it's part of the democratic process, which is what makes this country important. Amazing. He's like, and people who, you know, get a chance. Yeah. People like who grew up here kind of like don't appreciate that. So they do don't. you feel like you like, how do you feel about America and and everything about it? Considering like, I mean, Where you've lived in a couple of different places. I have. And of all the places, this is the one place I've always felt like accepted, mm -hmm. even though it's not always the case. Mo like 90 percent of the time I have an incredible time mm -hmm. uh, I love everything about America I always say like <laughs> I love flushing the toilet because I when I lived in South Africa I had a flushing toilet but there was like sometimes we'd go visit my grandma in Rwanda or something and we'd be out in the country where she lives and there's not like a flushing toilet mm -hmm. and I'd be like ah oh. and when I got to America I was like yay Flush, oh, so nice, so yeah. clean. <laughs> so it's all like these little, There's so many, many little conveniences amenities. that we don't think about. No, and like the fact that I can make money doing OnlyFans and porn is just like bananas to me. And like, yeah. I don't, I didn't ever hear that, that being an opportunity where I'm from. Like, it's very like taboo to even dress sexually or wear a crop top or anything. But in America, you can you can really find yourself and you can develop any business that you want. Like f small business is my whole thing right now. Like I just want to own something mm -hmm. and America makes that super easy and school is free. If it wasn't for high school, I would not be a good dancer. Like I would be a horrific dancer, mm -hmm. but I went to a public high school and they had a dance team that was like top notch. 
we went to nationals and I just, I always appreciated the opportunity from just school, which was free. And that's not the case everywhere. I mean, I went to private school my whole life and my parents had to pay out the, I've like so much money all the time. Yeah. And I come here and I've got teachers that are really nice to me. Like they don't hit me. <laughs> my teachers in Rwanda would hit me. Yeah. And I came here and I was like, did you just call me darling? Like, that's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> but the education's great. And the streets, the, like you're, the highways here alone are like, they cost about a whole city somewhere else, you know, mm -hmm. just to drive around and have any kind of food you want anytime. It's a really amazing place to live. Yeah. Yeah, I love it here. Yeah. I'm USA all day. <laughs> it's nice to hear like that outside point of view from people because I think that growing up in this country, you get kind of spoiled. We, we do, and we take things for granted. Yep. And for it, sure. it, it's like human nature to not be satisfied. You know, yeah. If we were ever satisfied, we would live in a cage or a cave and still, you know, not even have fire probably because they'd just be okay with not having enough. So yeah. I kind of admire the American spirit to just always get more, like more mm -hmm. all the time. But sometimes it's good to count your chickens and be grateful yeah. that you're in a great place. You can call the police anytime, anywhere they will come. Ambulance anytime. Well, like, sometimes. Okay. Sometimes. They don't always come. <laughs> I don't know. But <laughs> you just, and I have had that experience. <laughs> oh, no. That's crazy. But overall, it's definitely much better. Yeah. And you can kind of trust other people for professional services mm -hmm. you know? there's yelp and reviews and you can really just kind of choose people are held to like a certain standard yeah there's a definitely yeah. an accountability you can't yeah. just be an asshole yeah like, you will be put on blast <laughs> yeah you'll get canceled which is crazy <laughs> <laughs> all right guys we're gonna take a quick commercial break and then when we come back we're gonna talk about how liz got into sex work and what she is doing right now so hang tight we'll be right back Hey listeners, let's talk about something that might be a bit sensitive, but totally normal, occasional performance issues in the bedroom. Yes, guys, we know it happens and it's nothing to be ashamed of. Life can just get in the way sometimes, stress, tiredness, you name it. But here's some good news, Blue Chew is here to help. Blue Chew isn't just for chronic ED, it's for any guy who wants to step up his game and feel more confident in bed. We're talking about a chewable tablet that's made in the USA and prescribed online. It's shipped in discreet packaging, so no awkward moments at the pharmacy or doctor's office. Imagine being ready whenever the mood strikes with a little boost from Blue Chew. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code HOLLY to receive your first month for free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank BlueChew for sponsoring the podcast. So remember, BlueChew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at BlueChew.com. Chew it and do it. All right, everybody. So we are back. Um, so let's talk about how you got into stripping. Because you got into stripping like as soon as you turned 18, as right? As quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I waited till like we graduated high school for sure. But I, I my birthday's in March, so it wasn't too long after my mm -hmm. birthday. And my best friend at the time, she called me and she was like, do you remember how we're always talking about stripping and how crazy it is? But like we would totally do it. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's like, hey, do you can I come pick you up and we go audition? And I was like, yes, come now. So I climbed out of my bedroom window. Because <laughs> your parents are pretty strict with you, they're right? They're so strict. Like, there's no going outside unless it's for school. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. Like, mm -hmm. no hanging out with friends. So I climbed out the window, second story. I had a, I had a system at the time, which now seems crazy. But um, I left and we went to the strip club. And the first club said no because she was with me she's white mm -hmm. and i'm black but we didn't see that at the time you know mm -hmm. like that's just my best friend and the manager told her like if you come back without your friend you got the job <clears throat> oh, and she was like well fuck you wow <laughs> she loved me so we went to another club and i we got hired and it was so surreal like i wasn't even sure what i was doing but i was like you know but you loved dance. I so loved you knew to how dance. to dance and move yep. your body. And we were both on like the dance team. So we we knew we were hot. We just mm -hmm. didn't know how to use it mm -hmm. quite yet. So we went to a sex shop and we got stripper heels. 
and pasties. Oh my God. And I just stood in my bed, like my bedroom and I looked at myself in the heels with no shirt on and just underwear. And I was like, what the heck? What am I doing? Mm -hmm. This is so crazy. I felt weird. I was like, am I fat? Am I hot? Am I not hot? Because I was a virgin. So I was yeah. like, how am I going to seduce anyone? I've never yeah. had sex. Like, they're going to see right through me. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Screw it. You learn on the job. You just go figure it out. Mm -hmm. And um, we got there, and it was my turn to dance on stage. So your friend went first? Yeah, she went How'd first. How'd she do? Like she did okay -ish. I mean, it was still awkward. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I can outdo her, I think. So I get on stage, and there's a pole but it's a spinning pole. Uh -huh. I had never heard of a spinning pole in my life. So it's not it's not secure. So you get it and you think it's going to stay. I was like, like stay. I it was going to be a still pole. Yeah. So I walk up there. I'm all sexy. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And I grab it. <laughs> and I try to lean into it. But like my momentum kind of swung me oh, forward. Oh, no. <laughs> And then I fell into this man. Oh, no. <laughs> and this table was right there. So I just hear like, <sighs> and I'm tall. So you just hear heels. I see my foot flying. Oh. And this man's like oh, petrified. He's like, oh my God. And then I was like, as long this as I don't- This is like within five seconds of me being on five stage Five seconds, for the first time. I just got there. I was, my name was Jasmine or something dumb. <laughs> and I was like, here I go, here's Jasmine. And Jasmine fell on this man. And the whole day I was like, as long as I don't fall off the stage, no one's gonna know. And I fell off immediately because I thought about it too much. You know, you kind of manifest your, your future when you over, <laughs> yeah, oh my God. Absolutely. Uh, so this very nice man was like, is it your first time, sweetie? And I was like, ew, no. <laughs> it's like, fudge, there goes the whole thing. And I was shaking, like my hands were shaking. And he gave me all the ones that he had. He was like, good effort. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. After that, I was like, okay. I tried. I fell. It's done. Now I, it can't get any worse. Yeah, yeah. So it definitely got better. <laughs> Oh but my yeah, goodness. That was a crazy day. <laughs> so then tell us, like, so did you start stripping regularly? Like, how yeah. did that go? So when I went home, I like was counting all my money, like under my bed sheet with a flashlight. I was like, wow, oh my God, I'm rich. I have $140. Like the description that you've given me so far, it's literally straight out of a movie. <laughs> like girl goes up on stage, movie. unstable pole, falls yeah. into a table. Uh, gets all this money, counts it <laughs> under the bed sheets with a flashlight. Literally, like, movie. I was living. And I called my little sister into my room. I was like, come see. She was like, you're crazy. I was like, look at all this money. It was like $140. But at the time, it felt like a million dollars. I was like, wow. Think all the candy bars that could buy. I know. I was like, we're going to be rich. We need so much candy. <laughs> and she was my little partner in crime. So, like, when I would sneak out, she would, like, keep the window open, like, make sure I get down safely. And then she would shut it. And she'd be like, be careful. And I was like, oh. I gotta get back for my little sister. <laughs> she loves me so much. <laughs> but she was always like looking out for me. Like one time I asked her to go downstairs and like break a plate and like cause a distraction in the kitchen so I can go to the front door. And she did. And I could hear my dad back there like, what's going on in here? Oh my God. And I was like, bless her heart. Oh, she's so sweet. So I like ran out the front door and I just, I always bought her whatever she wanted with all my money and be like, I got you that Victoria's Secret bag. <laughs> got you <laughs> and then after a while I went to college and when I was in college I just was out in the country it was really boring and you can only country dance so many times before mm -hmm. you're like I miss the city I miss the strip club and I would go back every now and again and mm -hmm. get a hotel with like my college mates and they would stay in the room one of them would do homework and the other one would go see her boyfriend and I would go to the strip club and then we'd all meet back up at the motel <laughs> oh my God. and go back to school. And those are a terrible little secret. And sometimes we'd be like on the road to back to school and we'd stop at like a hotel. And it was my idea to bring all our luggage in and get free breakfast because we were kind of poor. <laughs> so we'd just come into a random hotel with all our luggage and be like, oh, wow, yummy breakfast for us that have been staying here at all. And we just hit the road again just felt you like you probably never got stopped no nope, they yeah. never stopped us they're like you want more waffles i'm like yes please <laughs> even though i was not there <laughs> yeah so i had a really good time and when i went back to school i mean i failed all my classes because mm -hmm. i was having a really good time it's really hard to pass now you were a virgin in college right i was and 
your friends made fun of you for that. They did. They were all like, we're going to go get some dick. Like, uh, and I'm like, that sounds great. <laughs> Wish I could do that. And they're like, you're a stripper. You should have all the dicks, you know? And I was like, no, I'm scared. Also, uh, mm-hmm. what if, ugh. But then after a while of being at school and getting bullied, I was like, you know what? I mean, some girls came into my room and they were just like, what the hell is your problem, man? <laughs> so many boys on campus. So I just, one day coming back to my dorm, I saw this guy and he was standing by my door to get into the building and he was talking with another dude. And I was like, he looks cuter than the other one. So I'm just going to bang that one. And my friends were like, he's what? You don't even know him. And I was like, I don't care. So I talked to him for a minute and I was like, do you want to have sex with me? And he was like, what? <laughs> It's like every man's dream. Yeah, he was like, I don't know like, what's that's happening. That's how it happens, right? Girls right? He was like, you're lying. <laughs> he totally thought I was full of shit. And I was like, just, I'm in this dorm, so come with me now. We're going to do it now. <laughs> and he was like, okay. <laughs> and so I had bought a box of Magnum condoms, like the biggest one that rubbers. they have. Yeah, the rubbers. <laughs> Not the erasers. The Well, they kind of erase, if we're being honest. Yeah. And so <laughs> I opened the condoms and I remember just being so nervous. I was like, he's going to know I'm a virgin. Like, there's no way. Because I didn't want to tell him in case he's like, oh, you're weird. I want to have sex with a porn star. Because that's what I thought in my head. Like, boys don't like virgins. They've never had sex. Why would you have sex with someone who doesn't know what they're doing? That's not the case. And boys who like virgins, that's there's something nefarious about that. Right. You know what I mean? I'm like like somebody wanting someone who's like inexperienced. Yeah. Like, I'm like, why do you want to take advantage of me? <laughs> yeah. It's a little weird. It's a little strange. Yeah. So I ripped the condom off. I was trying to be like as knowledgeable and sexy as possible. And it was really uneventful. It was OK. Um, I was like, I'm not going to do this again with you. But thanks for opening that door. Now I'm free. I'm sexually liberated. But I did not come at all. I was no. like, I have a better time on my own, but <laughs> good effort. Well, it's, I mean, I don't know how it was for you, but I mean, for me, it was painful. To it was so painful. Yeah. Like, that sure condom is. was rough. I was like, oh, yeah. This is, this Especially is... with a condom. Yeah. Did you tell him afterwards that you were a virgin? I did. And how did he, he was, react? He was like, no, I don't want you to fall in love with me or anything. I was like, ew. <laughs> get over yourself. Get dude. over yourself, buddy. Like, I didn't even come. So I'm, I think I can get past this one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fall in love with me. I didn't make I you didn't. come and you had a terrible time, but I'm a man with a penis. Yes. And you've never had sex before. So, so that obviously means you're gonna be attached to me. You're gonna love me. Yeah, you're gonna follow me around like a puppy. I was like, I'm gonna try this with lots of boys. Think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Funny time. So you've also mentioned how you've had some experiences being a unicorn. Can you explain what that is? So a uh, unicorn is like a single girl or a boy, I think. Uh, that has sex with couples Mm -hmm. and um there was some couples like it would go good um the a couple bad ones like this guy he told me that his wife wanted to have sex with me and him and i was like okay that sounds great let's do it and um when i met her she actually didn't even know i was coming and that was so awkward i was like oh no She's like, what are you doing here? I was like, your husband said. And then he like went to the bathroom or something. So I'm just sitting there with her. And I was like, you know what? You're a lovely lady. So let's just keep chatting. And then she warmed up to me. But when we were all having sex, it was just very uncomfortable because she was not expecting me to be there. And he was just being weird. Like, why did you It was you not clearly tell like, yeah, he yeah, was he just part, maybe threw it trying on her. to get her into it. And yeah. she was doing it because... She wanted to make him happy. Yeah, big time. It felt like that. But the whole time she was like talking shit to him. It was so awful. <laughs> She's like, you're an asshole and all this stuff. And I was like, I think I want to go. And after a while, I got to leave. But Wait, wait, hold on, hold yeah. on. While you guys were having sex, she's... She was mad at him. At him. Yeah. But she's still participating. Right. Still participating because like she would like grab my boobs and like lick on me and stuff. So I was like, okay, I think we're cool. But then like... Two minutes later, she'd be like, you know what? You're a fucking asshole. How could you do this to me? And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go. This is so uncomfortable. Oh, so weird. Yeah. But I've also had great ones where, like, this really hot guy and his wife was so hot. They were both just beautiful people. And I was like, I love y'all. Yeah. <laughs> and so they invited me over. And she uh, didn't, like, reciprocate anything sexual to me. She was like, you can fuck my husband and you can, like, kiss on me. But I'm not going to kiss you or lick on you. or And I will fuck my husband. And I was like, okay. So it was like a, a weird one, but I've had other ones that were much better. Mm-hmm. Just like everyone's happy that I'm there. We're all kissing, having a great time. Mm-hmm. And that that was the most fun. 
But yeah. there's a couple awkward ones where I was not invited and I felt so weird. So you were invited by the man, but not the woman. Not the woman. So weird. Oh, so uncomfortable. Yeah. I felt for her. I was like, I'm so sorry, ma'am. Now, you also were doing some camming, right? Mm -hmm. Was it about this time that you started to get into like online sex work? Yeah, that's really the time. Because when COVID hit, after I got my nursing degree, I just like was not getting any job offers that were going to pay for my lifestyle even mm -hmm. close. So I was like, I think I need to be more independent and not depend on people to pay me. I can do something. I have all this time. I'm young. I have no children. Like, why would I wait for a corporation to pay me the whole time? Mm -hmm. So I went on the cam and yeah, it was it was a lot of hours of camming with thousands of strangers. There was good times. There was some strange times, but it was mostly good. You got a request to do race play, right? Can yeah. you explain to the audience like what that is and what that experience was like? Yeah, so he wanted to like say like racially discriminate discriminatory things to me, like call me names and just like that's how he gets off. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted to do like a private session with me, which costs money. And I was like, OK, sure. So I accepted the offer. And as he was typing stuff, I would just like be texting on my phone <laughs> and I just let him do whatever he wanted. I didn't read anything that he said to me, but it went on for like 20 minutes or so. So I got paid a pretty penny, but I have no idea what he said. I just didn't want to be offended or judge someone for their sexual thing. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not a very judgmental person. If you like unicorns or you want to put stuff in your <laughs> butt, mean, like, whatever. On one hand, I get that. And that's admirable to not be judgmental of someone's kink. But if someone's kink is putting down somebody else. What is with that guy? Race, like that's. <laughs> I that's feel like strange kink. I feel like we could maybe shame you a little bit. About yeah, that. I definitely wanted to. And that's why I didn't read like, it. Because if I read it, I would have had so much more to say about him. But I was yeah. like, you know what? Put my blinders on. Just get on my phone. Look at other stuff. So was it, did he, could he not see you? Was it just a text back and forth situation? Um, he could see me, but I couldn't see him. Okay. And uh, I just like laid on the bed with like my legs open and he would just like look at me and just say all this weird stuff. Could he tell that you were ignoring him? Yeah, big time. And he didn't care. He just was happy I accepted it. Cause I don't think anyone really accepts Probably these most fucking most offers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm just happy to be here. Blah, 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 blah. And wow. I was like, okay. I've also had a, another guy in a private session. He was like, can I tell you weird stuff that's happened to me? And I was like, okay. And he said that his girlfriend at the time blindfolded him, put him in a barn and like, oh my God, I don't even know if I can say this, but like had sex with a horse or something. Wow. <laughs> I was like, all right. That sounds like a fantasy. That yeah, because he, he was saying wished... like, oh, this happened to me. Yeah, I'm but sure that I was that like, didn't... sure. Yeah. He paying those tokens and I'm in here. You know what? I mean, like <laughs> we we try not to kink shame mm -hmm. when it's something that doesn't hurt other people. Yeah. But I think that that the first example sure. that, that you brought up is that hurts that's, some that hurts people for sure. Yeah. I mean, if it hurt you, which it seems like it did. It then... definitely I was I didn't even want to read it because I didn't want to get hurt. Really but awful. that was like the only one I ever accepted. Because after yeah. that, I was like, this is probably wrong. This feels wrong. Yeah. This feels weird. And I shouldn't have to feel weird because I no. love sex. I yeah. love everything sexual and I didn't want to ruin my view on porn and everything. So Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be those kinds of people out there. Just weirdos. Out but there. you don't have to entertain them and give them your time. No, no. That was one and done. Yeah. I was 20 years old, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> we all live and learn. Yeah. I was, I was, I'm a curious cat. Sometimes you're too curious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's yeah. good to... It's good to have experiences and, and learn from them, I guess. Yeah. Um, so you, did you then start an OnlyFans? Is that what yeah. happened after? Do you do that after camming? Mm -hmm. I did that like right as I did camming because mm -hmm. other girls had like OnlyFans links on their pages. And I was like, what is OnlyFans? And I looked it up and I was like, okay, I'll sign up. And mm -hmm. I did not make a lot of money at first. I made like $20. It's hard. Time. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. Like if you don't have a social media following, mm -hmm. that's why you know, this idea, because OnlyFans has obviously become like a huge like, thing, such a big thing. And people are like, oh, I'm going to start an OnlyFans. I'm like, if you don't have a big social media following, it's don't not worry. like, you know, because the thing is with OnlyFans, too, is that there's not a lot of discoverability. No, just you have starting to look a profile. That up. Yeah. So it's it's not that easy to get people to your page to start with. It is difficult. And that's when I learned about marketing and advertising. Like 
any kind of business you do, you need to get eyes on your mm -hmm. product so people can buy it. And it seems so simple, but when you're like a kid and you don't really know what you're doing, I had to do a lot of research to like learn where to get the eyes and everything. And I think also too, when people get into sex work, they don't necessarily think that they're actually gonna have to work. start learning about marketing, mm -hmm. but like marketing is a huge it's like the whole thing. part of it because yeah. it's, I mean, you really are an independent contractor. I mean, you spoke earlier about like starting your own business. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's literally what it is. Yep. Like you're running your own business and you need social media, you need marketing. And you know what's really funny? <laughs> I didn't realize this, what? but I found this on Etsy and I just thought it was so cool. Do you know you can go on Etsy and you can buy like PDFs of like marketing tools and stuff for OnlyFans. Really? Yeah, there's a whole, there's a ton of it. So you That's can buy cool. like captions for your pictures. Oh you God. can buy like a content creation, like calendar suggestions. Oh, that's so you can cool. buy like, you can buy JOI scripts. Like, I don't even know what that is. I feel like I need to know Jerk that. off instruction. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. yeah, that's hot. Like they're <laughs> honestly like no joke. Yeah. I found like a wealth of useful stuff on Etsy. Etsy of all places. I of thought you said places. Reddit or literally anywhere else Etsy's besides Etsy. Got, I mean, you know, they're like electronic. It's like three bucks for, I would you know, definitely like pay three bucks to learn A hundred captions. Cause sometimes I'd run out of shit that I, I know, gotta say about like, myself. It's like. Titties again. Like, yeah, do I? <laughs> exactly. So it's, it, but it's interesting cause you see like all, you know, the marketing skills that come in and these people who realize that there is so much marketing behind OnlyFans that they can start a side business yeah. on marketing yes. for OnlyFans. For only like fans. it's a whole other thing. Instructional videos on how to start one. Like, yeah. I had to watch that. so many YouTube videos and like, what's a good, what to do? And yeah. I was like, these girls have like thousands of views teaching you how to use mm -hmm. an app. And that's like business all by itself, you know? Yeah. So much opportunity with that. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. It's really interesting. And you get to be more independent. Mm-hmm. So um, now you've done scenes on your OnlyFans, right? Mm -hmm. So how did that go? Like, how did you book your first scene? Uh, it took a while. A lot of the, like the first time I did a lot of solo stuff. So I'd put like stuff in my butt, in my vagina, and like just lube it up and I would just go crazy. And I made like hundreds of videos. And people would be like, hey, can we see you have sex with someone? That'd be mm -hmm. cool. And I'm like, that makes sense. You don't just want to see my boobs over and over again. So I reached out to an old friend that I had had sex with before. He was great. And I was like, do you want to be nice to me and help me make money? <laughs> He's like, you just can't put my face in it and mm -hmm. I will I will fuck you. And I was like, cool. So then I started making more money because I was doing blowjobs, which is my favorite thing in the whole world, even personally, like not just in business. I, I love to give pleasure and that's just makes me happy. Mm -hmm. And I, I genuinely get more excited. Like the more he's excited, I'm like, oh my God, it's working. Yeah. It's getting so hard. There's yeah. something very empowering about giving yeah. blowjobs. It's so sweet. I'm like, yeah. oh, you're, you love me. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a good job. I'm but it's like this physical job. representation. It of is. You right can't in front fake of you. it. Can't miss it. It's in your face. <laughs> it, it, it gets visibly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it shows you. <laughs> yeah. I love how honest and pure it can be. So mm -hmm. I just started making more money and getting more fans because I was just like being myself more and just really showing boys what I care about, which is sex. I love it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it got definitely much better. But yeah, it was an old friend of mine and I was like, will you just keep helping me with these? <laughs> he does. Is that, so is that the only person that you've done scenes with? Yeah, and I would love to do more. Like I saw this girl, she does this like fuck a fan thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. Like I would totally do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know a few girls that do that. It's, it seems fun. Like, your number one fan is here, and he's like, can I put it in you? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is yes. If you can if you can get it up. If you can get it up there, which is terrifying. Always work. No, yeah. it can be very intimidating. Very, yeah. And I feel for them, because yeah. I just have to be here and just be hot. I know. But it's 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 a lot more work for the guys. It is. They have to not be nervous, which I, I guess makes your boner go down. Yeah. Makes my lady boner go up. So I'm like, I don't understand what the problem is. I'm so scared right now, I could just jizz everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> hey, y'all. That's just girl stuff. <laughs> so um, you've been open about uh, doing escorting. Yeah. Um, so tell me, like, maybe what are your experiences have been in that department? It's been wonderful. Um, I've had really, like, a lot of fun. I've met people that are, like, they're too important to even tell me what their name is, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, they have to be under, like, an alias, and we meet, like, a really fancy, swanky hotel and go to restaurants. And I've 
literally been surrounded by celebrities because of escorting like Mm -hmm. people i never would have met otherwise that Mm -hmm. just like want a classy girl to take out on the town and i know a lot of stuff and i've been around the world so i can relate to them a lot easier and i'm very polite and i'm like a princess so Mm -hmm. i try to carry myself that way so i've had a lot of good times um i've rejected a lot of people there's a lot of weirdos out there and i will not hang out with them under any circumstances Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i just like i'm very particular clients first super hard and i get criticized a lot for that and they're like why are you being so intense and i'm like it's my safety yeah i don't have to spend time with you sir and if you don't want to tell me who you are or be honest and clear with me i don't i don't have to spend time with you so yeah i always try to be as um harsh as possible Mm -hmm. and just for my own sake yeah because you know it's not about quantity it's about quality absolutely and you don't get to hang out with cool people if you just do random weird stuff you know yeah yeah so it's been awesome one of my favorite interviews that i've done was with amy taylor who's an escort and she's um just really brilliant and she she talked a lot about how her you know vast knowledge of a lot of different topics her ability to like you know because she can't like I think she was a pilot at one point and she can like play golf and she can like you know ski and like all of these skills that she has that enables people to take her places so they can take her to on these amazing vacations they can take her to company dinners like that kind of thing and she can absolutely you know feel comfortable look good and represent them right right exactly so it really is like a companion experience and how it's so much more about that than any like kind of intimacy any other that like when someone is with you and they're vibing with you you can feel it you know Mm -hmm. and not everyone that looks really pretty can carry themselves that way Mm -hmm. you know you might see a gorgeous girl and you take her to dinner and she has no table manners Mm -hmm. or is drinking too much or Mm -hmm. it can be really embarrassing for high-end clients that just have to look good all the time and if they're in front of work colleagues like you cannot embarrass them at yeah all. and if you have nothing to talk about but you know just you know, i'm hot it's not good you're not yeah. gonna get very far so yeah. i think that that skill can be underestimated especially by people that don't know yeah like it takes a lot of work to be someone like a good companion mm-hmm. for someone else yeah. yeah but i've spent so much time with people that have just told me their deepest darkest secrets and use me as therapy and I'm here for it yeah (laughs) I love it I love to bring comfort to others and remind them that we're all human beings nobody's perfect you don't have to be perfect all the time like Mm -hmm. if you fart I will fart so that you feel better (laughs) wow that is that is next level (laughs) I'm like I don't want anyone to feel like oh I'm better than you so you have Mm -hmm. to be a certain way for me because I'm really not I'm just just a regular regular old gal Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have about escorting? Um, that num. Let's see. Uh, that it has to always be sexual, or that you need plastic surgery, or that you need to be a certain height, or a model, or anything. There is everyone has a different preference. So if your body is different, you just can't go off like what you think. You have to really try stuff to see where you fit in. Because mm-hmm. I thought maybe I wouldn't be good at this job, but it turns out I am. People enjoy my story. And even though I'm from a different place, you don't always feel like people want that. You know, I think maybe someone wants a more familiar culture to spend time with. But sometimes they're like, I want to meet someone from somewhere completely different and learn something else. Yeah. So it's not um, it's not a very tight. You can anyone can really be an escort if mm-hmm. you are the right personality for the person mm. that's looking. Yeah, I think a lot of that's it's it, very right? much a lot about personality. Yeah, yeah, and, and actually being interested in other people. Yeah, which and a lot being of us genuine. aren't. Yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? it can be hard, <laughs> especially if like you don't even vibe with them. But yeah, I, being from different places, I have a story for everyone, mm-hmm. and I find that I can pretty much meet anyone and fit in with them. It sounds like you've had a lot of practice in having to adapt to your environment. I have. That's like my whole thing, I think. I didn't even notice, really. Like, from the time I was little, I just always spent time either at school or at home alone. So I really got to find out who I am by playing lots of solo games and playing with my little sister and my dad and my mom being there for me all the time. They just always painted this beautiful picture of the world. 
so I never had like bad experiences so when I grew up I was like excited to be a person you know mm-hmm. and not like oh awful things happen men are scary I love my dad I love men in general like I always told my dad like when I get married it's gonna be a dude like you mm-hmm. <laughs> he would be like you're so funny but it's true I just I love male energy and like a good male energy you know mm-hmm. there's some toxic men but there's also really sweet men like we all have good dads some some of us and that kind of warm fatherly love I look forward to that so mm-hmm. I've always had a good uh, feeling about the world in general yeah I was very sheltered so when I find out weird stuff like oh you can't work at the strip club because you're too dark I'm like whatever <laughs> I don't care I know I'm beautiful. My dad said so. So it <laughs> doesn't oh, matter what you say. <laughs> I love that. It's so true. Because I've felt I've faced some discrimination because I wanted to work at high end clubs and even urban clubs with like African Americans. I don't always fit in there. Like mm-hmm. I'll go in there. And nobody likes me or mm-hmm. they think I talk weird or I'm being posh or trying to act white or what else did they say? Yeah, like I'm not from I don't have any tattoos. So. I just always found myself like not fitting in in a lot of places Mm -hmm. but um at the same time i'm like an octopus i guess i just try to adapt and like change my everything to fit in so yeah you're right i do adopt a lot lot. (laughs) i mean it's interesting because you know the thing that you hear all the time is that every girl who's in sex work is broken in some way, has daddy yeah. issues, right? You know, um, has no other options in life. Right, um, like it's it, the last. Resort. It sounds like you came from, you know, a family that, even though you were sheltered, a family that provided you ed- education. Mm-hmm. You guys had money. You had mm-hmm. opportunity. You went to college. You got yep. a degree. I did. You have a good relationship with your father. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, why? What is it about the like adult industry that makes you want to stay oh just the porn i love it i've been watching it for so long i'm a huge fan and even when i was like young i would like i just knew that i would excel at this because i'm a lover (laughs) and like being surrounded by all this love i i love my family and everything but they just filled me up with love and i just have so much to give so I know it's not like something they would approve of or think is okay, but I think that that is better than murder or like violence, you know? Like you can go to the movie theater and watch people just get blown to bits, but you can't watch someone do anal like, oh no, they're having sex. What are they making love? That's awful. (laughs) So I've always been like very against violence, but I'm pro love. So porn is like the loviest place on the planet. It's all love in there. (laughs) So that's why I love it. I can't. I can't separate myself. I don't care if it upsets people because I know I'm not doing anything truly wrong. Mm -hmm. It's for entertainment, which is something I've consumed myself. So I feel like I owe all the porn stars I've watched to give them some too. Oh my God. (laughs) I've seen some, and Riley Reed, like I'm obsessed with her. Like I used to watch her porn all the time. And then I saw her on your show and I was like, ah. Yeah, yeah, she's, she's a real person. She's so beautiful. And she is a real person. <laughs> she is. I was like, wow. I watched the whole thing. I was like, she's so freaking animated and she like is. she's alive. She's like, a lot of fun. Wow. She's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. I was a huge fan of hers for a long time. So I just love porn world, and I don't care if I get in trouble for it. I'm publicly saying that now, like just whatever. It's a love. It's a loving world. Wow. Yeah. You have a very unique outlook on life and I'm here for it. Yay. (laughs) I love that. And I was so excited to come on your show because you interview like everyone. And when I wanted to do porn, I was like, I'm going to study all of Holly Randall's every single video because you ask genuine questions and the people that answer always seem so comfortable and like they're really telling the truth. So I felt like it was a good source to like learn about safety in porn and like how does it actually go? And it helped me a lot. God. Yeah, I'm so happy to hear that. Hey. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was such a pleasure to get to know you. Um, you're definitely a very unique person, yeah. and um, you have a really unique story and outlook on life. And it just, I don't know, I really like wish you all the best. Mm-hmm. And you brought a, like a lot of light and positivity into this room today. So thank, thank you. you so much. It was honestly my pleasure. <laughs> I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Absolutely. So my Instagram is the number one and only Liz F, Liz with an I. And my Instagram is, 
Oh, wait, that was my Instagram. And then my Twitter is Lizzie Magoo 24270. And my OnlyFans is OnlyFans.com slash Liz.Ferrari. Perfect. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Of course, if you want to watch these interviews streamed live, join my Patreon at patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us, and I'll see you next week.